Chapter Three of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Chapter Three. An Unpleasant Predicament. Part One. This unpleasant business occurred at the epoch when the regeneration of our beloved fatherland and the struggle of her valiant sons towards new hopes and destinies was beginning with irresistible force and with a touchingly naive impetuosity. One winter evening in that period, between eleven and twelve o'clock, three highly respectable gentlemen were sitting in a comfortable and even luxuriously furnished room in a handsome house of two stories on the Petersburg side and were engaged in a staid and edifying conversation on a very interesting subject these three gentlemen were all of general's rank they were sitting round a little table each in a soft and handsome armchair and as they talked they quietly and luxuriously sipped champagne the bottle stood on the table on a silver stand with ice round it the fact was that the host, a privy councillor called Stepan Nikiforovitch Nikiforov, an old bachelor of sixty-five, was celebrating his removal into a house he had just bought, and, as it happened, also his birthday, which he had never kept before. The festivity, however, was not on a very grand scale. As we have seen already, there were only two guests, both of them former colleagues and former subordinates of Mr. Nikiforov that is, an actual civil councillor called Semyon Ivanovitch Shipulenko, and another actual civil councillor, Ivan Ilyich Prelinsky. They had arrived to tea at nine o'clock, then had begun upon the wine, and knew that at exactly half-past eleven they would have to set off home. Their host had all his life been fond of regularity. A few words about him he had begun his career as a petty clerk with nothing to back him had quietly plodded on for forty-five years knew very well what to work towards had no ambition to draw the stars down from heaven though he had two stars already and particularly disliked expressing his own opinion on any subject he was honest too that is it had not happened to him to do anything particularly dishonest he was a bachelor because he was an egoist he had plenty of brains but he could not bear showing his intelligence he particularly disliked slovenliness and enthusiasm regarding it as moral slovenliness and towards the end of his life had become completely absorbed in a voluptuous indolent comfort and systematic solitude though he sometimes visited people of a rather higher rank than his own yet from his youth up he could never endure entertaining visitors himself and of late he had if he did not play a game of patience been satisfied with the society of his dining-room clock and would spend the whole evening dozing in his armchair listening placidly to its ticking under its glass case on the chimney-piece in appearance he was closely shaven and extremely proper looking he was well preserved looking younger than his age he promised to go on living many years longer and closely followed the rules of the highest good breeding his post was a fairly comfortable one he had to preside somewhere and to sign something in short he was regarded as a first-rate man he had only one passion or more accurately one keen desire that was to have his own house and a house built like a gentleman's residence not a commercial investment his desire was at last realized he looked out and bought a house on the petersburg side a good way off it is true but it had a garden and was an elegant house the new owner decided that it was better for being a good way off he did not like entertaining at home and for driving to see any one or to the office he had a handsome carriage of a chocolate hue a coachman mihay and two little but strong and handsome horses all this was honourably acquired by the careful frugality of forty years so that his heart rejoiced over it this was how it was that stepan nikiforovitch felt such pleasure in his placid heart 
that he actually invited two friends to see him on his birthday which he had hitherto carefully concealed from his most intimate acquaintances he had special designs on one of these visitors he lived in the upper story of his new house and he wanted a tenant for the lower half which was built and arranged in exactly the same way stepan nikiforovitch was reckoning upon semyon ivanovitch shipulenko and had twice that evening broached the subject in the course of conversation but semyon ivanovitch made no response the latter too was a man who had doggedly made a way for himself in the course of long years he had black hair and whiskers and a face that always had a shade of jaundice he was a married man of morose disposition who liked to stay at home he ruled his household with a rod of iron in his official duties he had the greatest self-confidence he too knew perfectly well what goal he was making for and better still what he never would reach he was in a good position and he was sitting tight there though he looked upon the new reforms with a certain distaste he was not particularly agitated about them he was extremely self-confident and listened with a shade of ironical malice to ivan ilyitch prelinsky expatiating on new themes all of them had been drinking rather freely however so that stepan nikiforovitch himself condescended to take part in a slight discussion with mr prelinsky concerning the latest reforms but we must say a few words about his excellency mr pralinsky especially as he is the chief hero of the present story the actual civil councillor ivan ilyitch pralinsky had only been his excellency for four months in short he was a young general he was young in years too only forty-three no more and he looked and liked to look even younger he was a tall handsome man he was smart in his dress and prided himself on its solid dignified character with great aplomb he displayed an order of some consequence on his breast from his earliest childhood he had known how to acquire the airs and graces of aristocratic society and being a bachelor dreamed of a wealthy and even aristocratic bride he dreamed of many other things though he was far from being stupid at times he was a great talker and even liked to assume a parliamentary pose he came of a good family he was the son of a general and brought up in the lap of luxury in his tender childhood he had been dressed in velvet and fine linen had been educated at an aristocratic school and though he acquired very little learning there he was successful in the service and had worked his way up to being a general the authorities looked upon him as a capable man and even expected great things from him in the future stepan nikiforovitch under whom ivan ilyitch had begun his career in the service and under whom he had remained until he was made a general had never considered him a good business man and had no expectations of him whatever what he liked in him was that he belonged to a good family had property that is a big block of buildings let out in flats in charge of an overseer was connected with persons of consequence and what was more had a majestic bearing stepan nikiforovitch blamed him inwardly for excess of imagination and instability ivan ilyitch himself felt at times that he had too much amour propre and even sensitiveness strange to say he had attacks from time to time of morbid tenderness of conscience and even a kind of faint remorse with bitterness and a secret soreness of heart he recognized now and again that he did not fly so high as he imagined at such moments he sank into despondency especially when he was suffering from hemorrhoids called his life une existence manquée and ceased privately of course to believe even in his parliamentary capacities calling himself a talker a maker of phrases and though all that of course did him great credit 
it did not in the least prevent him from raising his head again half an hour later and growing even more obstinately even more conceitedly self-confident and assuring himself that he would yet succeed in making his mark and that he would be not only a great official but a statesman whom russia would long remember he actually dreamed at times of monuments from this it will be seen that ivan ilyitch aimed high though he hid his vague hopes and dreams deep in his heart even with a certain trepidation in short he was a good-natured man and a poet at heart of late years these morbid moments of disillusionment had begun to be more frequent he had become peculiarly irritable ready to take offence and was apt to take any contradiction as an affront but reformed russia gave him great hopes his promotion to general was the finishing touch he was roused he held his head up he suddenly began talking freely and eloquently he talked about the new ideas which he very quickly and unexpectedly made his own and professed with vehemence he sought opportunities for speaking drove about the town and in many places succeeded in gaining the reputation of a desperate liberal which flattered him greatly that evening after drinking four glasses he was particularly exuberant he wanted on every point to confute stepan nikiforovitch whom he had not seen for some time past and whom he had hitherto always respected and even obeyed he considered him for some reason reactionary and fell upon him with exceptional heat stepan nikiforovitch hardly answered him but only listened slyly though the subject interested him ivan ilyitch got hot and in the heat of the discussion sipped his glass more often than he ought to have done then stepan nikiforovitch took the bottle and at once filled his glass again which for some reason seemed to offend ivan ilyitch especially as semyon ivanovitch shipolenko whom he particularly despised and indeed feared on account of his cynicism and ill-nature preserved a treacherous silence and smiled more frequently than was necessary they seem to take me for a schoolboy flashed across ivan ilyitch's mind no it was time high time he went on hotly we have put it off too long and to my thinking humanity is the first consideration humanity with our inferiors remembering that they too are men humanity will save everything and bring out all that is <laughs> was heard from the direction of semyon ivanovitch but why are you giving us such a talking to stepan nikiforovitch protested at last with an affable smile i must own ivan ilyitch i have not been able to make out so far what you are maintaining you advocate humanity that is love of your fellow-creatures isn't it yes if you like i allow me as far as i can see that's not the only thing love of one's fellow-creatures has always been fitting the reform movement is not confined to that all sorts of questions have arisen relating to the peasantry the law courts economics government contracts morals and 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 those questions are endless and altogether may give rise to great upheavals so to say that is what we have been anxious about and not simply humanity yes the thing is a bit deeper than that observed semyon ivanovitch i quite understand and allow me to observe semyon ivanovitch that i can't agree to being inferior to you in depth of understanding ivan ilyitch observed sarcastically and with excessive sharpness however i will make so bold as to assert stepan nikiforovitch that you have not understood me either no i haven't and yet i maintain and everywhere advance the idea that humanity and nothing else with one's subordinates from the official in one's department down to the copying clerk from the copying clerk down to the house serf from the servant down to the peasant humanity i say may serve so to speak as the cornerstone of the coming reforms and the reformation of things in general why because take a syllogism i am human consequently i am loved 
i am loved so confidence is felt in me there is a feeling of confidence and so there is trust there is trust and so there is love that is no i mean to say that if they trust me they will believe in the reforms they will understand so to speak the essential nature of them will so to speak embrace each other in a moral sense and will settle the whole business in a friendly way fundamentally what are you laughing at semyon ivanovitch can't you understand stepan nikiforovitch raised his eyebrows without speaking he was surprised i fancy i have drunk a little too much said semyon ivanovitch sarcastically and so i am a little slow of comprehension not quite all my wits about me ivan ilyitch winced we should break down stepan nikiforovitch pronounced suddenly after a slight pause of hesitation how do you mean we should break down asked ivan ilyitch surprised at stepan nikiforovitch's abrupt remark why we should break under the strain stepan nikiforovitch evidently did not care to explain further i suppose you are thinking of new wine in old bottles ivan ilyitch replied not without irony well i can answer for myself anyway at that moment the clock struck half-past eleven one sits on and on but one must go at last said semyon ivanovitch getting up but ivan ilyitch was before him he got up from the table and took his sable cap from the chimney-piece he looked as though he had been insulted so how is it to be semyon ivanovitch will you think it over said stepan nikiforovitch as he saw the visitors out about the flat you mean i'll think it over i'll think it over well when you have made up your mind let me know as soon as possible still on business mr pralinsky observed affably in a slightly ingratiating tone playing with his hat it seemed to him as though they were forgetting him stepan nikiforovitch raised his eyebrows and remained mute as a sign that he would not detain his visitors semyon ivanovitch made haste to bow himself out well after that what is one to expect if you don't understand the simple rules of good manners mr pralinsky reflected to himself and held out his hand to stepan nikiforovitch in a particularly off-hand way in the hall ivan ilyitch wrapped himself up in his light expensive fur coat he tried for some reason not to notice semyon ivanovitch's shabby raccoon and they both began descending the stairs the old man seemed offended said ivan ilyitch to the silent semyon ivanovitch no why answered the latter with cool composure servile flunkey ivan ilyitch thought to himself they went out at the front door semyon ivanovitch's sledge with a grey ugly horse drove up what the devil what has trifon done with my carriage cried ivan ilyitch not seeing his carriage the carriage was nowhere to be seen stepan nikiforovitch's servant knew nothing about it they appealed to varlam semyon ivanovitch's coachman and received the answer that he had been standing there all the time and that the carriage had been there but now there was no sign of it an unpleasant predicament mr shipolenko pronounced shall i take you home scoundrelly people mr pralinsky cried with fury he asked me the rascal to let him go to a wedding close here in the petersburg side some crony of his was getting married deuce take her i sternly forbade him to absent himself and now i'll bet he has gone off there he certainly has gone there sir observed varlam but he promised to be back in a minute to be here in time that is well there it is i had a presentiment that this would happen i'll give it to him you'd better give him a good flogging once or twice at the police station then he will do what you tell him said semyon ivanovitch as he wrapped the rug round him please don't you trouble semyon ivanovitch well won't you let me take you along merci bon voyage semyon ivanovitch drove off while ivan ilyitch set off on foot along the wooden pavement conscious of a rather acute irritation yes indeed i'll give it to you now you rogue i am going on foot on purpose to make you feel it to frighten you 
he will come back and hear that his master has gone off on foot the blackguard ivan ilyitch had never abused any one like this but he was greatly angered and besides there was a buzzing in his head he was not given to drink so five or six glasses soon affected him but the night was enchanting there was a frost but it was remarkably still and there was no wind there was a clear starry sky the full moon was bathing the earth in a soft silver light it was so lovely that after walking some fifty paces ivan ilyitch almost forgot his troubles he felt particularly pleased people quickly change from one mood to another when they are a little drunk he was even pleased with the ugly little wooden houses of the deserted street it's really a capital thing that i am walking he thought it's a lesson to trifon and a pleasure to me i really ought to walk oftener and i shall soon pick up a sledge on the great prospect it's a glorious night what little houses they all are i suppose small fry live here clerks tradesmen perhaps that stepan nikiforovitch what reactionaries they all are those old fogies fogies yes c'est le mot he is a sensible man though he has that bon sens sober practical understanding of things but they are old old there is a lack of what is it there is a lack of something we shall break down what did he mean by that he actually pondered when he said it he didn't understand me a bit and yet how could he help understanding it was more difficult not to understand it than to understand it the chief thing is that i am convinced convinced in my soul humanity the love of one's kind restore a man to himself revive his personal dignity and then when the ground is prepared get to work i believe that's clear yes allow me your excellency take a syllogism for instance we meet for instance a clerk a poor downtrodden clerk well who are you answer a clerk very good a clerk further what sort of clerk are you answer i am such and such a clerk he says are you in the service i am do you want to be happy i do what do you need for happiness this and that why because and there the man understands me with a couple of words the man's mine the man is caught so to speak in a net and i can do what i like with him that is for his good horrid man that semyon ivanovitch and what a nasty fizz he has flog him in the police station he said that on purpose no you are talking rubbish you can flog but i'm not going to i shall punish trifon with words i shall punish him with reproaches he will feel it as for flogging hmm, it's an open question hmm. what about going to emirates oh damnation take it the cursed pavement he cried out suddenly tripping up and this is the capital enlightenment one might break one's leg hmm. i detest that semyon ivanovitch a most revolting fizz he was chuckling at me just now when i said they would embrace each other in a moral sense well and they will embrace each other and what's that to do with you i'm not going to embrace you i'd rather embrace a peasant if i meet a peasant i shall talk to him i was drunk though and perhaps did not express myself properly possibly i'm not expressing myself rightly now hmm. i shall never touch wine again in the evening you babble and next morning you are sorry for it after all i am walking quite steadily but they are all scoundrels anyhow so ivan ilyitch meditated incoherently and by snatches as he went on striding along the pavement the fresh air began to affect him set his mind working five minutes later he would have felt soothed and sleepy but all at once scarcely two paces from the great prospect he heard music he looked round on the other side of the street in a very tumble-down looking long wooden house of one story there was a great fete 
there was the scraping of violins and the droning of a double bass and the squeaky tooting of a flute playing a very gay quadrille tune under the window stood an audience mainly of women in wadded pelisses with kerchiefs on their heads they were straining every effort to see something through a crack in the shutters evidently there was a gay party within the sound of the thud of dancing feet reached the other side of the street ivan ilyitch saw a policeman standing not far off and went up to him whose house is that brother he asked flinging his expensive fur coat open just far enough to allow the policeman to see the imposing decoration on his breast it belongs to the registration clerk seldonimov answered the policeman drawing himself up instantly discerning the decoration seldonimov bah seldonimov what is he up to getting married yes your honour to a daughter of a titular councillor lakopateyev a titular councillor used to serve in the municipal department that house goes with the bride so that now the house is seldonimov's and not mlekopateyev's yes seldonimov's your honour it was mlekopateyev's but now it is seldonimov's hm i am asking you my man because i am his chief i am a general in the same office in which seldonimov serves just so your excellency the policeman drew himself up more stiffly than ever while ivan ilyitch seemed to ponder he stood still and meditated yes seldonimov really was in his department and in his own office he remembered that he was a little clerk with a salary of ten roubles a month as mr pralinsky had received his department very lately he might not have remembered precisely all his subordinates but seldonimov he remembered just because of his surname it had caught his eye from the very first so that at the time he had had the curiosity to look with special attention at the possessor of such a surname he remembered now a very young man with a long hooked nose with tufts of flaxen hair lean and ill-nourished in an impossible uniform and with unmentionables so impossible as to be actually unseemly he remembered how the thought had flashed through his mind at the time shouldn't he give the poor fellow ten roubles for christmas to spend on his wardrobe but as the poor fellow's face was too austere and his expression extremely unprepossessing even exciting repulsion the good-natured idea somehow faded away of itself so seldonimov did not get his tip he had been the more surprised when this same seldonimov had not more than a week before asked for leave to be married ivan ilyitch remembered that he had somehow not had time to go into the matter so that the matter of the marriage had been settled off-hand in haste but yet he did remember exactly that seldonimov was receiving a wooden house and four hundred roubles in cash as dowry with his bride the circumstance had surprised him at the time he remembered that he had made a slight jest over the juxtaposition of the names seldonimov and Nekopateyev. he remembered all that clearly he recalled it and grew more and more pensive it is well known that whole trains of thought sometimes pass through our brains instantaneously as though they were sensations without being translated into human speech still less into literary language but we will try to translate these sensations of our heroes and present to the reader at least the kernel of them so to say what was most essential and nearest to reality in them for many of our sensations when translated into ordinary language seem absolutely unreal that is why they never find expression though every one has them of course ivan ilyitch's sensations and thoughts were a little incoherent but you know the reason why flashed through his mind here we all talk and talk but when it comes to action it all ends in nothing here for instance take this seldonimov he has just come from his wedding full of hope and excitement looking forward to his wedding feast this is one of the most blissful days of his life now he is busy with his guests is giving a banquet a modest one poor but gay and full of genuine gladness 
what if he knew that at this very moment i i his superior his chief am standing by his house listening to the music yes really how would he feel no what would he feel if i suddenly walked in hmm. of course at first he would be frightened he would be dumb with embarrassment i should be in his way and perhaps should upset everything yes that would be so if any other general went in but not i that's a fact any one else but not i yes stepan nikiforovitch you did not understand me just now but here is an example ready for you yes we all make an outcry about acting humanely but we are not capable of heroism of fine actions what sort of heroism this sort consider in the existing relations of the various members of society for me for me after midnight to go in to the wedding of my subordinate a registration clerk at ten roubles the month why it would mean embarrassment a revolution the last days of pompeii a nonsensical folly no one would understand it stepan nikiforovitch would die before he understood it why he said we should break down yes but that's you old people inert paralytic people but i shan't break down i will transform the last day of pompeii to a day of the utmost sweetness for my subordinate and a wild action to an action normal patriarchal lofty and moral how like this kindly listen here i go in suppose they are amazed leave off dancing look wildly at me draw back quite so but at once i speak out i go straight up to the frightened seldonimov and with a most cordial affable smile in the simplest words i say this is how it is i have been at his excellency stepan nikiforovitch's and i expect you know close here in the neighbourhood well then lightly in a laughing way i shall tell him of my adventure with trifon from trifon i shall pass on to saying how i walked here on foot well i heard music i inquired of a policeman and learned brother that it was your wedding let me go in i thought to my subordinates let me see how my clerks enjoy themselves and celebrate their wedding i suppose you won't turn me out turn me out what a word for a subordinate how the devil could he dream of turning me out i fancy that he would be half crazy that he would rush headlong to seat me in an armchair would be trembling with delight would hardly know what he was doing for the first minute why what can be simpler more elegant than such an action why did i go in that's another question that is so to say the moral aspect of the question that's the pith hm. what was i thinking about yes well of course they will make me sit down with the most important guest some titular councillor or a relation who's a retired captain with a red nose gogol describes these eccentrics so capitally well i shall make acquaintance of course with the bride i shall compliment her i shall encourage the guests i shall beg them not to stand on ceremony to enjoy themselves to go on dancing i shall make jokes i shall laugh in fact i shall be affable and charming i am always affable and charming when i am pleased with myself hm. the point is that i believe i am still a little well not drunk exactly but of course as a gentleman i shall be quite on an equality with them and shall not expect any especial marks of but morally morally it is a different matter they will understand and appreciate it my actions will evoke their nobler feelings well i shall stay for half an hour even for an hour i shall leave of course before supper but they will be bustling about baking and roasting they will be making low bows but i will only drink a glass congratulate them and refuse supper i shall say business and as soon as i pronounce the word business all of them will at once have sternly respectful faces by that i shall delicately remind them that there is a difference between them and me the earth and the sky it is not that i want to impress that on them but it must be done it's even essential in a moral sense when all is said and done i shall smile at once however i shall even laugh and then they will all pluck up courage again 
i shall jest a little again with the bride hm i may even hint that i shall come again in just nine months to stand godfather <laughs> and she will be sure to be brought to bed by then they multiply you know like rabbits and they will all roar with laughter and the bride will blush i shall kiss her feelingly on the forehead even give her my blessing and next day my exploit will be known at the office next day i shall be stern again next day i shall be exacting again even implacable but they will all know what i am like they will know my heart they will know my essential nature he is stern as chief but as a man he is an angel and i shall have conquered them i shall have captured them by one little act which would never have entered your head they would be mine i should be their father they would be my children come now your excellency stepan nikiforovitch go and do likewise but do you know do you understand that seldonimov will tell his children how the general himself feasted and even drank at his wedding why you know those children would tell their children and those would tell their grandchildren as a most sacred story that a grand gentleman a statesman and i shall be all that by then did them the honour and so on and so on why i am morally elevating the humiliated i restore him to himself why he gets a salary of ten roubles a month if i repeat this five or ten times or something of the sort i shall gain popularity all over the place my name will be printed on the hearts of all and the devil only knows what will come of that popularity these or something like these were ivan ilyitch's reflections a man says all sorts of things sometimes to himself gentlemen especially when he is in rather an eccentric condition all these meditations passed through his mind in something like half a minute and of course he might have confined himself to these dreams and after mentally putting stepan nikiforovitch to shame have gone very peacefully home and to bed and he would have done well but the trouble of it was that the moment was an eccentric one as ill luck would have it at that very instant the self-satisfied faces of stepan nikiforovitch and semyon ivanovitch suddenly rose before his heated imagination we shall break down repeated stepan nikiforovitch smiling disdainfully <laughs> semyon ivanovitch seconded him with his nastiest smile well we'll see whether we do break down ivan ilyitch said resolutely with a rush of heat to his face he stepped down from the pavement and with resolute steps went straight across the street towards the house of his registration clerk seldonimov end of chapter three Chapter Four of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Chapter Four. An Unpleasant Predicament, Part Two. His star carried him away he walked confidently in at the open gate and contemptuously thrust aside with his foot the shaggy husky little sheep-dog who flew at his legs with a hoarse bark more as a matter of form than with any real intention along a wooden plank he went to the covered porch which led like a sentry-box to the yard and by three decaying wooden steps he went up to the tiny entry here though a tallow candle or something in the way of a night light was burning somewhere in a corner it did not prevent ivan ilyitch from putting his left foot just as it was in its galosh into a galantine which had been stood out there to cool ivan ilyitch bent down and looking with curiosity he saw that there were two other dishes of some sort of jelly and also two shapes apparently of blancmange the squashed galantine embarrassed him and for one brief instant the thought flashed through his mind whether he should not slink away at once 
but he considered this too low reflecting that no one would have seen him and that they would never think he had done it he hurriedly wiped his galosh to conceal all traces fumbled for the felt-covered door opened it and found himself in a very little ante-room half of it was literally piled up with greatcoats wadded jackets cloaks capes scarves and galoshes in the other half the musicians had been installed two violins a flute and a double bass a band of four picked up of course in the street they were sitting at an unpainted wooden table lighted by a single tallow candle and with the utmost vigor were sawing out the last figure of the quadrille from the open door into the drawing-room one could see the dancers in the midst of dust tobacco smoke and fumes there was a frenzy of gaiety there were sounds of laughter shouts and shrieks from the ladies the gentlemen stamped like a squadron of horses above all the bedlam there rang out words of command from the leader of the dance probably an extremely free and easy and even unbuttoned gentleman gentlemen advance ladies chain set to partners and so on and so on ivan ilyitch in some excitement cast off his coat and galoshes and with his cap in his hand went into the room he was no longer reflecting however for the first minute nobody noticed him all were absorbed in dancing the quadrille to the end ivan ilyitch stood as though entranced and could make out nothing definite in the chaos he caught glimpses of ladies dresses of gentlemen with cigarettes between their teeth he caught a glimpse of a lady's pale blue scarf which flicked him on the nose after the wearer a medical student with his hair blown in all directions on his head pranced by in wild delight and jostled violently against him on the way he caught a glimpse too of an officer of some description who looked half a mile high some one in an unnaturally shrill voice shouted oh seldonimov as the speaker flew by stamping it was sticky under ivan ilyitch's feet evidently the floor had been waxed in the room which was a very small one there were about thirty people but a minute later the quadrille was over and almost at once the very thing ivan ilyitch had pictured when he was dreaming on the pavement took place a stifled murmur a strange whisper passed over the whole company including the dancers who had not yet had time to take breath and wipe their perspiring faces all eyes all faces began quickly turning towards the newly arrived guest then they all seemed to draw back a little and beat a retreat those who had not noticed him were pulled by their coats or dresses and informed they looked round and at once beat a retreat with the others ivan ilyitch was still standing at the door without moving a step forward and between him and the company there stretched an ever-widening empty space of floor strewn with countless sweetmeat wrappings bits of paper and cigarette ends all at once a young man in a uniform with a shock of flaxen hair and a hooked nose stepped timidly out into that empty space he moved forward hunched up and looked at the unexpected visitor exactly with the expression with which a dog looks at its master when the latter has called him up and is going to kick him good evening seldonimov do you know me said ivan ilyitch and felt at the same minute that he had said this very awkwardly he felt too that he was perhaps doing something horribly stupid at that moment your excellency muttered seldonimov to be sure i have called in to see you quite by chance my friend as you can probably imagine but evidently seldonimov could imagine nothing he stood with staring eyes in the utmost perplexity you won't turn me out i suppose pleased or not you must make a visitor welcome ivan ilyitch went on feeling that he was confused to a point of unseemly feebleness that he was trying to smile and was utterly unable that the humorous reference to stepan nikiforovitch and trifon was becoming more and more impossible but as ill-luck would have it 
seldonimov did not recover from his stupefaction and still gazed at him with a perfectly idiotic air ivan ilyitch winced he felt that in another minute something incredibly foolish would happen i am not in the way am i i'll go away he faintly articulated and there was a tremor at the right corner of his mouth but seldonimov had recovered himself good heavens your excellency the honour he muttered bowing hurriedly graciously sit down your excellency and recovering himself still further he motioned him with both hands to a sofa before which a table had been moved away to make room for the dancing ivan ilyitch felt relieved and sank on the sofa at once some one flew to move the table up to him he took a cursory look round and saw that he was the only person sitting down all the others were standing even the ladies a bad sign but it was not yet time to reassure and encourage them the company still held back while before him bending double stood seldonimov utterly alone still completely at a loss and very far from smiling it was horrid in short our hero endured such misery at that moment that his harun al rashid like descent upon his subordinates for the sake of principle might well have been reckoned an heroic action but suddenly a little figure made its appearance beside seldonimov and began bowing to his inexpressible pleasure and even happiness ivan ilyitch at once recognized him as the head clerk of his office akim petrovitch zubikov and though of course he was not acquainted with him he knew him to be a business-like and exemplary clerk he got up at once and held out his hand to akim petrovitch his whole hand not two fingers the latter took it in both of his with the deepest respect the general was triumphant the situation was saved and now indeed seldonimov was no longer so to say the second person but the third it was possible to address his remarks to the head clerk in his necessity taking him for an acquaintance and even an intimate one and seldonimov meanwhile could only be silent and be in a tremor of reverence so that the proprieties were observed and some explanation was essential ivan ilyitch felt that he saw that all the guests were expecting something that the whole household was gathered together in the doorway almost creeping climbing over one another in their anxiety to see and hear him what was horrid was that the head clerk in his foolishness remained standing why are you standing said ivan ilyitch awkwardly motioning him to a seat on the sofa beside him oh don't trouble i'll sit here and akim petrovitch hurriedly sat down on a chair almost as it was being put for him by seldonimov who remained obstinately standing can you imagine what happened addressing himself exclusively to akim petrovitch in a rather quavering though free and easy voice he even drawled out his words with special emphasis on some syllables pronounced the vowel ah like eh in short felt and was conscious that he was being affected but could not control himself some external force was at work he was painfully conscious of many things at that moment can you imagine i have only just come from stepan nikiforovitch nikiforov's you have heard of him perhaps the privy councillor you know on that special committee akim petrovitch bent his whole person forward respectfully as much as to say of course we have heard of him he is your neighbour now ivan ilyitch went on for one instant for the sake of ease and good manners addressing seldonimov but he quickly turned away again on seeing from the latter's eyes that it made absolutely no difference to him the old fellow as you know has been dreaming all his life of buying himself a house well and he has bought it and a very pretty house too yes and to-day was his birthday and he had never celebrated it before he used even to keep it secret from us he was too stingy to keep it <laughs> but now he is so delighted over his new house that he invited semyon ivanovitch shipolenko and me you know 
akim petrovitch bent forward again he bent forward zealously ivan ilyitch felt somewhat comforted it had struck him indeed that the head clerk possibly was guessing that he was an indispensable point d'appui for his excellency at that moment that would have been more horrid than anything so we sat together the three of us he gave us champagne we talked about problems even disputed <laughs> akim petrovitch raised his eyebrows respectfully only that is not the point when i take leave of him at last he is a punctual old fellow goes to bed early you know in his old age i go out my trifon is nowhere to be seen i am anxious i make inquiries what has trifon done with the carriage it comes out that hoping i should stay on he had gone off to the wedding of some friend of his or sister maybe goodness only knows somewhere here on the petersburg side and took the carriage with him while he was about it again for the sake of good manners the general glanced in the direction of seldonimov the latter promptly gave a wriggle but not at all the sort of wriggle the general would have liked he has no sympathy no heart flashed through his brain you don't say so said akim petrovitch greatly impressed a faint murmur of surprise ran through all the crowd can you fancy my position ivan ilyitch glanced at them all there was nothing for it i set off on foot i thought i would trudge to the great prospect and there find some cabby <laughs> <laughs> akim petrovitch echoed again a murmur but this time on a more cheerful note passed through the crowd at that moment the chimney of a lamp on the wall broke with a crash some one rushed zealously to see to it seldonimov started and looked sternly at the lamp but the general took no notice of it and all was serene again i walked and the night was so lovely so still all at once i heard a band stamping dancing i inquired of a policeman it is seldonimov's wedding why you are giving a ball to all petersburg side my friend <laughs> he turned to seldonimov again <laughs> to be sure akim petrovitch responded there was a stir among the guests again but what was most foolish was that seldonimov though he bowed did not even now smile but seemed as though he were made of wood is he a fool or what thought ivan ilyitch he ought to have smiled at that point the ass and everything would have run easily there was a fury of impatience in his heart i thought i would go in to see my clerk he won't turn me out i expect pleased or not one must welcome a guest you must please excuse me my dear fellow if i am in the way i will go i only came in to have a look but little by little a general stir was beginning akim petrovitch looked at him with a mawkishly sweet expression as though to say how could your excellency be in the way all the guests stirred and began to display the first symptoms of being at their ease almost all the ladies sat down a good sign and a reassuring one the boldest spirits among them fanned themselves with their handkerchiefs one of them in a shabby velvet dress said something with intentional loudness the officer addressed by her would have liked to answer her as loudly but seeing that they were the only ones speaking aloud he subsided the men for the most part government clerks with two or three students among them looked at one another as though egging each other on to unbend cleared their throats and began to move a few steps in different directions no one however was particularly timid but they were all restive and almost all of them looked with a hostile expression at the personage who had burst in upon them to destroy their gaiety the officer ashamed of his cowardice began to edge up to the table but i say my friend allow me to ask you your name ivan ilyitch asked seldonimov porfiry petrovitch your excellency answered the latter with staring eyes as though on parade introduce me porfiry petrovitch to your bride take me to her i and he showed signs of a desire to get up 
but seldonimov ran full speed to the drawing-room the bride however was standing close by at the door but as soon as she heard herself mentioned she hid a minute later seldonimov led her up by the hand the guests all moved aside to make way for them ivan ilyitch got up solemnly and addressed himself to her with a most affable smile very very much pleased to make your acquaintance he pronounced with a most aristocratic half-bow especially on such a day he gave a meaning smile there was an agreeable flutter among the ladies charme the lady in the velvet dress pronounced almost aloud the bride was a match for seldonimov she was a thin little lady not more than seventeen pale with a very small face and a sharp little nose her quick active little eyes were not at all embarrassed on the contrary they looked at him steadily and even with a shade of resentment evidently seldonimov was marrying her for her beauty she was dressed in a white muslin dress over a pink slip her neck was thin but she had a figure like a chicken's with the bones all sticking out she was not equal to making any response to the general's affability but she is very pretty he went on in an undertone as though addressing seldonimov only though intentionally speaking so that the bride could hear but on this occasion too seldonimov again answered absolutely nothing and did not even wriggle ivan ilyitch fancied that there was something cold suppressed in his eyes as though he had something peculiarly malignant in his mind and yet he had at all costs to wring some sensibility out of him why that was the object of his coming they are a couple though he thought and he turned again to the bride who had seated herself beside him on the sofa but in answer to his two or three questions he got nothing but yes or no and hardly that if only she had been overcome with confusion he thought to himself then i should have begun to banter her but as it is my position is impossible and as ill luck would have it akim petrovitch too was mute though this was only due to his foolishness it was still unpardonable my friends haven't i perhaps interfered with your enjoyment he said addressing the whole company he felt that the very palms of his hands were perspiring no don't trouble your excellency we are beginning directly but now we are getting cool answered the officer the bride looked at him with pleasure the officer was not old and wore the uniform of some branch of the service seldonimov was still standing in the same place bending forward and it seemed as though his hooked nose stood out further than ever he looked and listened like a footman standing with the greatcoat on his arm waiting for the end of his master's farewell conversation ivan ilyitch made this comparison himself he was losing his head he felt that he was in an awkward position that the ground was giving way under his feet that he had got in somewhere and could not find his way out as though he were in the dark suddenly the guests all moved aside and a short thick-set middle-aged woman made her appearance dressed plainly though she was in her best with a big shawl on her shoulders pinned at her throat and on her head a cap to which she was evidently unaccustomed in her hands she carried a small round tray on which stood a full but uncorked bottle of champagne and two glasses neither more nor less evidently the bottle was intended for only two guests the middle-aged lady approached the general don't look down on us your excellency she said bowing since you have deigned to do my son the honour of coming to his wedding we beg you graciously to drink to the health of the young people do not disdain us do us the honour ivan ilyitch clutched at her as though she were his salvation she was by no means an old woman forty-five or forty-six not more but she had such a good-natured rosy-cheeked 
such a round and candid russian face she smiled so good-humouredly bowed so simply that ivan ilyitch was almost comforted and began to hope again so you are the mother of your son he said getting up from the sofa yes my mother your excellency mumbled seldonimov craning his long neck and thrusting forward his long nose again ah i am delighted delighted to make your acquaintance do not refuse us your excellency with the greatest pleasure the tray was put down seldonimov dashed forward to pour out the wine ivan ilyitch still standing took the glass i am particularly particularly glad on this occasion that i can he began that i can testify before all of you in short as your chief i wish you madam he turned to the bride and you friend porfiry i wish you the fullest completest happiness for many long years and he positively drained the glass with feeling the seventh he had drunk that evening seldonimov looked at him gravely and even sullenly the general was beginning to feel an agonizing hatred of him and that scarecrow he looked at the officer keeps obtruding himself he might at least have shouted hurrah and it would have gone off it would have gone off and you too akim petrovitch drink a glass to their health added the mother addressing the head clerk you are his superior he is under you look after my boy i beg you as a mother and don't forget us in the future our good kind friend akim petrovitch how nice these old russian women are thought ivan ilyitch she has livened us all up i have always loved the democracy at that moment another tray was brought to the table it was brought in by a maid wearing a crackling cotton dress that had never been washed and a crinoline she could hardly grasp the tray in both hands it was so big on it there were numbers of plates of apples sweets fruit meringues and fruit cheeses walnuts and so on and so on the tray had been till then in the drawing-room for the delectation of all the guests and especially the ladies but now it was brought to the general alone do not disdain our humble fare your excellency what we have we are pleased to offer the old lady repeated bowing delighted said ivan ilyitch and with real pleasure took a walnut and cracked it between his fingers he had made up his mind to win popularity at all costs meantime the bride suddenly giggled what is it asked ivan ilyitch with a smile encouraged by this sign of life ivan kostenkinitch here makes me laugh she answered looking down the general distinguished indeed a flaxen-headed young man exceedingly good-looking who was sitting on a chair at the other end of the sofa whispering something to madame seldonimov the young man stood up he was apparently very young and very shy i was telling the lady about a dream-book your excellency he muttered as though apologizing about what sort of dream-book asked ivan ilyitch condescendingly there is a new dream-book a literary one i was telling the lady that to dream of mr panayev means spilling coffee on one's shirt-front what innocence thought ivan ilyitch with positive annoyance though the young man flushed very red as he said it he was incredibly delighted that he had said this about mr panayev to be sure i have heard of it responded his excellency no there is something better than that said a voice quite close to ivan ilyitch there is a new encyclopedia being published and they say mr kreevsky will write articles and satirical literature this was said by a young man who was by no means embarrassed but rather free and easy he was wearing gloves and a white waistcoat and carried a hat in his hand he did not dance and looked condescending for he was on the staff of a satirical paper called the firebrand and gave himself airs accordingly 
he had come casually to the wedding invited as an honoured guest of the seldonimovs with whom he was on intimate terms and with whom only a year before he had lived in very poor lodgings kept by a german woman he drank vodka however and for that purpose had more than once withdrawn to a snug little back room to which all the guests knew their way the general disliked him extremely and the reason that's funny broke in joyfully the flaxen-headed young man who had talked of the shirt-front and at whom the young man on the comic paper looked with hatred in consequence it's funny your excellency because it is supposed by the writer that mr kraevsky does not know how to spell and thinks that satirical ought to be written with a y instead of an i but the poor young man scarcely finished his sentence he could see from his eyes that the general knew all this long ago for the general himself looked embarrassed and evidently because he knew it the young man seemed inconceivably ashamed he succeeded in effacing himself completely and remained very melancholy all the rest of the evening but to make up for that the young man on the staff of the firebrand came up nearer and seemed to be intending to sit down somewhere close by such free and easy manners struck ivan ilyitch as rather shocking tell me please porfiry he began in order to say something why i have always wanted to ask you about it in person why you are called seldonimov instead of pseudonimov your name surely must be pseudonimov i cannot inform you exactly your excellency said seldonimov it must have been that when his father went into the service they made a mistake in his papers so that he has remained now seldonimov put in akim petrovitch that does happen undoubtedly the general said with warmth undoubtedly for only think pseudonimov comes from the literary word pseudonym while seldonimov means nothing due to foolishness added akim petrovitch you mean what is due to foolishness the russian common people in their foolishness often alter letters and sometimes pronounce them in their own way for instance they say nevalid instead of invalid oh yes nevalid <laughs> mumber too they say your excellency boomed out the tall officer who had long been itching to distinguish himself in some way what do you mean by mumber mumber instead of number your excellency oh yes mumber instead of number to be sure to be sure <laughs> ivan ilyitch had to do a chuckle for the benefit of the officer too the officer straightened his tie another thing they say is nigh by the young man on the comic paper put in but his excellency tried not to hear this his chuckles were not at everybody's disposal nigh by instead of near the young man on the comic paper persisted in evident irritation ivan ilyitch looked at him sternly come why persist seldonimov whispered to him why i was talking mayn't one speak the latter protested in a whisper but he said no more and with secret fury walked out of the room he made his way straight to the attractive little back room where for the benefit of the dancing gentlemen vodka of two sorts salt fish caviar into slices and a bottle of very strong sherry of russian make had been set early in the evening on a little table covered with a yaroslav cloth with anger in his heart he was pouring himself out a glass of vodka when suddenly the medical student with the dishevelled locks the foremost dancer and cutter of capers at seldonimov's ball rushed in he fell on the decanter with greedy haste they are just going to begin he said rapidly helping himself come and look i am going to dance a solo on my head after supper i shall risk the fish dance it is just the thing for the wedding so to speak a friendly hint to seldonimov she's a jolly creature that cleopatra semyonovna you can venture on anything you like with her he's a reactionary said the young man on the comic paper gloomily as he tossed off his vodka who is a reactionary why the personage before whom they set those sweetmeats he's a reactionary i tell you what nonsense muttered the student and he rushed out of the room hearing the opening bars of the quadrille 
left alone the young man on the comic paper poured himself out another glass to give himself more assurance and independence he drank and ate a snack of something and never had the actual civil councillor ivan ilyitch made for himself a bitterer foe more implacably bent on revenge than was the young man on the staff of the firebrand whom he had so slighted especially after the latter had drunk two glasses of vodka alas ivan ilyitch suspected nothing of the sort he did not suspect another circumstance of prime importance either which had an influence on the mutual relations of the guests and his excellency the fact was that though he had given a proper and even detailed explanation of his presence at his clerk's wedding this explanation did not really satisfy any one and the visitors were still embarrassed but suddenly everything was transformed as though by magic all were reassured and ready to enjoy themselves to laugh to shriek to dance exactly as though the unexpected visitor were not in the room the cause of it was a rumour a whisper a report which spread in some unknown way that the visitor was not quite it seemed was in fact a little top-heavy and though this seemed at first a horrible calumny it began by degrees to appear to be justified suddenly everything became clear what was more they felt all at once extraordinarily free and it was just at this moment that the quadrille for which the medical student was in such haste the last before supper began and just as ivan ilyitch meant to address the bride again intending to provoke her with some innuendo the tall officer suddenly dashed up to her and with a flourish dropped on one knee before her she immediately jumped up from the sofa and whisked off with him to take her place in the quadrille the officer did not even apologize and she did not even glance at the general as she went away she seemed in fact relieved to escape after all she has a right to be thought ivan ilyitch and of course they don't know how to behave hm don't you stand on ceremony friend porfiry he said addressing seldonimov perhaps you have arrangements to make or something please don't put yourself out why does he keep guard over me he thought to himself seldonimov with his long neck and his eyes fixed intently upon him began to be insufferable in fact all this was not the thing not the thing at all but ivan ilyitch was still far from admitting this End of chapter four chapter five of short stories by fyodor dostoevsky part three an unpleasant predicament this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by fanny short stories by fyodor dostoevsky chapter five part three the quadrille began will you allow me your excellency asked akim petrovitch holding the bottle respectfully in his hands and preparing to pour from it into his excellency's glass i i really don't know whether but akim petrovitch with reverent and radiant face was already filling the glass after filling the glass he proceeded writhing and wriggling as it were stealthily as it were furtively to pour himself out some with this difference that he did not fill his own glass to within a finger length of the top and this seemed somehow more respectful he was like a woman in travail as he sat beside his chief what could he talk about indeed yet to entertain his excellency was an absolute duty since he had the honour of keeping him company the champagne served as a resource and his excellency too was pleased that he had filled his glass not for the sake of the champagne for it was warm and perfectly abominable but just morally pleased 
The old chap would like to have a drink himself, thought Ivan Ilyitch, but he doesn't venture till I do. I mustn't prevent him, and indeed it would be absurd for the bottle to stand between as untouched. He took a sip. Anyway, it seemed better than sitting doing nothing. I'm here, he said with pauses and emphasis. I am here, you know, so to speak, accidentally. And of course, it may be that some people would consider it unseemly for me to be at such a, a gathering. Akim Petrovitch said nothing, but listened with timid curiosity. But I hope you will understand with what object I have come. I haven't really come simply to drink wine, uh, he he. Akim Petrovitch tried to chuckle, following the example of his excellency, but again he could not get it out, and again he made absolutely no consolatory answer. I am here in order, so to speak, to encourage, to, to show, so to speak, a moral aim. Ivan Ilyitch continued, feeling vexed at Akim Petrovich's stupidity, but he suddenly subsided into silence himself. He saw that poor Akim Petrovich had dropped his eyes as though he were in fault. The general, in some confusion, made haste to take another sip from his glass, and Akim Petrovich clutched at the bottle as though it were his only hope of salvation, and filled the glass again. You haven't many resources, thought Ivan Ilyitch, looking sternly at poor Akim Petrovich. The latter, feeling that stern general like eye upon him, made up his mind to remain silent for good and not to raise his eyes. So they sat beside each other for a couple of minutes, two sickly minutes for Akim Petrovich. A couple of words about Akim Petrovich. He was a man of the old school, as meek as a hen, reared from infancy to obsequious servility, and at the same time a good-natured and even honorable man. He was a Petersburg Russian, that is, his father and his father's father were born, grew up and served in Petersburg, and had never once left Petersburg. That is quite a special type of Russian. They have hardly any idea of Russia, though that does not trouble them at all. Their whole interest is confined to Petersburg, and chiefly the place in which they serve. All their thoughts are concentrated on preference for farthing points on the shop and their month's salary. They don't know a single Russian custom, a single Russian song, except Lachinashka, and that only because it is played on the barrel organs. However, there are two fundamental and invariable signs by which you can at once distinguish a Petersburg Russian from a real Russian. The first sign is the fact that Petersburg Russians, all without exception, speak of the newspaper as the academic news and never call it the Petersburg news. The second and typically trustworthy sign is that Petersburg Russians never make use of the word breakfast, but always call it Frühstück, with a special emphasis on the first syllable. By these radical and distinguishing signs, you can tell them apart. In short, this is a humble type which has been formed during the last 35 years. Akim Petrovich, however, was by no means a fool. If the general had asked him a question about anything in his own province, he would have answered and kept up a conversation. As it was, it was unseemly for a subordinate even to answer such questions as these, though Akim Petrovich was dying from curiosity to know something more detailed about His Excellency's real intentions. And meanwhile, Ivan Ilyitch sank more and more into meditation and a sort of whirl of ideas, in his absorption, he sipped his glass every half minute. Akim Petrovich at once zealously filled it up. Both were silent. Ivan Ilyitch began looking at the dances and immediately something attracted his attention. One circumstance even surprised him. The dances were certainly lively. Here people danced in the simplicity of their hearts to amuse themselves and even to romp wildly. Among the dancers, few were really skillful, but the unskilled stamped so vigorously that they might have been taken for agile ones. The officer was among the foremost. He particularly liked the figures in which he was left alone to perform a solo. 
than he performed the most marvellous capers. For instance, standing upright as a post, he would suddenly bend over to one side, so that one expected him to fall over, but with the next step he would suddenly bend over in the opposite direction, at the same acute angle to the floor. He kept the most serious face and danced in the full conviction that everyone was watching him. Another gentleman, who had had rather more than he could carry before the quadrille, dropped a slip beside his partner so that his partner had to dance alone. The young registration clerk, who had danced with the lady in the blue scarf through all the figures and through all the five quadrilles which they had danced that evening, played the same prank the whole time. That is, he dropped a little behind his partner, seized the end of her scarf, and as they crossed over, succeeded in imprinting some twenty kisses on the scarf. His partner sailed along in front of him, as though she noticed nothing. The medical student really did dance on his head, and excited frantic enthusiasm, stamping and shrieks of delight. In short, the absence of constraint was very marked. Ivan Ilyich, whom the wine was beginning to affect, began by smiling, but by degrees a bitter doubt began to steal into his heart. Of course he liked free and easy manners and unconventionality. He desired, he had even inwardly prayed, for free and easy manners when they had all held back, but now that unconventionality had gone beyond all limits. One lady, for instance, the one in the shabby dark blue velvet dress, bowed forth hand, in the sixth figure pinned her dress so as to turn it into something like trousers. This was the Cleopatra Semyonovna, with whom one could venture to do anything as her partner, the medical student, had expressed it. The medical student defied description. He was simply a fucking. How was it? They had held back and now they were so quickly emancipated. One might think it nothing, but this transformation was somehow strange. It indicated something. It was as though they had forgotten Ivan Ilyich's existence. Of course, he was the first to laugh and even ventured to applaud. Akim Petrovich chuckled respectfully in unison, though indeed with evident pleasure, and no suspicion that His Excellency was beginning to nourish in his heart a new knowing anxiety. You dance capitally, young man, Ivan Ilyich was obliged to say to the medical student as he walked past him. The student turned sharply towards him, made a grimace, and bringing his face close into unseemly proximity to the face of His Excellency, crowed like a cock at the top of his voice. This was too much. Ivan Ilyich got up from the table. In spite of that, a roar of inexpressible laughter followed, for the crowd was an extraordinarily good imitation, and the whole performance was utterly unexpected. Ivan Ilyich was still standing in bewilderment when suddenly Pseldonimov himself made his appearance and with a bow began begging him to come to supper. His mother followed him. Your Excellency, she said, bowing, do us the honor. Do not disdain our humble fare. I, I really don't know, Ivan Ilyich was beginning. I did not come with that idea. I meant to be going. He was in fact holding his hat in his hands. What is more, he had at that very moment taken an inward vow at all costs to depart at once and on no account whatever to consent to remain, and uh, he remained. A minute later he led the procession to the table. Pseldonimov and his mother walked in front, clearing the way for him. They made him sit down in the seat of honor, and again a bottle of champagne, opened but not begun, was set beside his plate. By way of hors d'oeuvre, there were salt herrings and vodka. He put out his hand, poured out a large glass of vodka, and drank it off. He had never drunk vodka before. He felt as though he were rolling down a hill, were flying, 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 that he must stop himself, catch at something, but there was no possibility of it. His position was certainly becoming more and more eccentric. What is more, it seemed as though fate were mocking at him. God knows what had happened to him in the course of an hour or so. 
When he went in, he had, so to say, opened his arms to embrace all humanity, all his subordinates. And here, not more than an hour had passed, and in all his aching heart, he felt and knew that he hated Pseldonimov and was cursing him, his wife and his wedding. What was more, he saw from his face, from his eyes alone, that Pseldonimov himself hated him that he was looking at him with eyes that almost said, if only you would take yourself off, curse you, foisting yourself on us. All this he had read for some time in his eyes. Of course, as he sat down to table, Ivan Ilyich would sooner have had his hand cut off than have owned, not only aloud, but even to himself, that this was really so. The moment had not fully arrived yet. There was still a moral vacillation. But his heart, his heart, it ached. It was clamoring for freedom, for air, for rest. Ivan Ilyich was really too good-natured. He knew, of course, that he ought long before to have gone away, not merely to have gone away, but to have made his escape. That all of this was not the same, but had turned out utterly different from what he had dreamed of on the pavement. Why did I come? Did I come here to eat and drink? He asked himself as he tasted the salt herring. He even had attacks of skepticism. There was at times a faint stare of irony in regard to his own fine action at the bottom of his heart. He actually wondered at times why he had come in. But how could he go away? To go away like this without having finished the business properly was impossible. What would people say? they would say that he was frequenting low company indeed it really would amount to that if he did not end it properly what would stepan nikiforovich semyon ivanovich say for of course it would be all over the place by tomorrow what would be said in the offices at the shambles at the shabins no he must take his departure in such a way that all should understand why he had come he must make clear his moral aim and meantime the dramatic moment would not present itself they don't even respect me he went on thinking what are they laughing at they are as free and easy as though they had no feeling but i have long suspected that all the younger generation are without feeling i must remain at all costs they have just been dancing but now at table they will all be gathered together I will talk about questions, about reforms, about the greatness of Russia. I can still win their enthusiasm. Yes, perhaps nothing is yet lost. Perhaps it is always like this in reality. What should I begin upon with them to attract them? What plan can I hit upon? I am lost, simply lost. And what is it they want? What is it they require? I see they are laughing together there. Can it be at me? Merciful heavens! But what is it I want? Why is it I am here? Why don't I go away? Why do I go on persisting? He thought this, and a sort of shame, a deep unbearable shame, rent his heart more and more intensely. But everything went on in the same way, one thing after another. Just two minutes after he had sat down to the table, one terrible thought overwhelmed him completely. He suddenly felt that he was horribly drunk, that is, not as he was before, but hopelessly drunk. The cause of this was the glass of vodka which he had drunk after the champagne and which had immediately produced an effect. He was conscious, he felt in every fiber of his being, that he was growing hopelessly feeble. Of course, his assurance was greatly increased, but consciousness had not deserted him, and it kept crying out, It is bad, very bad, and in fact utterly unseemly. Of course, his unstable drunken reflections could not rest long on one subject. There began to be apparent, and unmistakably so, even to himself, two opposite sides. On one side, there was swaggering assurance a desire to conquer, a disdain of obstacles and a desperate confidence that he would attain his object. The other side showed itself in the aching of his heart and a sort of knowing in his soul. What would they say? How would it all end? 
What would happen to morrow, to morrow, to morrow? He had felt vaguely before that he had enemies in the company. No doubt that was because I was drunk, he thought, with agonizing doubt. What was his horror when he actually, by unmistakable signs, convinced himself now that he really had enemies at the table and that it was impossible to doubt of it. And why, why, he wondered. At the table there were all the thirty guests, of whom several were quite tipsy. Others were behaving with a careless and sinister independence, shouting and talking at the top of their voices, bawling out the toasts before the time, and petting the ladies with pellets of bread. One unprepossessing personage in a greasy coat had fallen off his chair as soon as he sat down, and remained so till the end of supper. Another one made desperate efforts to stand on the table, to propose a toast, and only the officer, who seized him by the tails of his coat, moderated his premature ardor. The supper was a pell-mell affair, although they had hired the cook, who had been in the service of a general. There was the galantine, there was tongue and potatoes, there were rissoles with green peas, there was finally a goose, and last of all blancmange. Among the drinks were beer, vodka, and sherry. The only bottle of champagne was standing beside the general, which obliged him to pour it out for himself and also for Akim Petrovitch, who did not venture at supper to officiate on his own initiative. The other guests had to drink the toasts in Caucasian wine or anything else they could get. The table was made up of several tables put together, among them even a card table. It was covered with many tablecloths, amongst them one colored Yaroslav cloth. The gentlemen sat alternately with the ladies. Pseldonimov's mother would not sit down to the table. She bustled about and supervised. But another sinister female figure, who had not shown herself till then, appeared on the scene wearing a reddish silk dress with a very high cap on her head and a bandage round her face for toothache. It appeared that this was the bride's mother who had at last consented to emerge from a back room for supper. She had refused to appear till then owing to her implacable hostility to Pseldonimov's mother, but to that we will refer later. This lady looked spitefully even sarcastically at the general and evidently did not wish to be presented to him. To Ivan Ilyich this figure appeared suspicious in the extreme, but apart from her, several other persons were suspicious and inspired involuntary apprehension and uneasiness. It even seemed that they were in some sort of plot together against Ivan Ilyich. At any rate, it seemed so to him, and throughout the whole supper he became more and more convinced of it. A gentleman with a beard, some sort of free artist, was particularly sinister. He even looked at Ivan Ilyich several times, and then, turning to his neighbor, whispered something. Another person present was unmistakably drunk, but yet, from certain signs, was to be regarded with suspicion. The medical student, too, gave rise to unpleasant expectations. Even the officer himself was not quite to be depended on. But the young man on the comic paper was blazing with hatred. He lolled in his chair, he looked so haughty and conceited, he snored so aggressively. And though the rest of the guests took absolutely no notice of the young journalist, who had contributed only four wretched poems to the firebrand, and had consequently become a liberal and evidently indeed disliked him, yet when a pellet of bread aimed in his direction fell near Ivan Ilyich, he was ready to stake his head that it had been thrown by no other than the young man in question. All this, of course, had a pitiable effect on him. Another observation was particularly unpleasant. Ivan Ilyich became aware that he was beginning to articulate indistinctly and with difficulty, that he was longing to say a great deal, but that his tongue refused to obey him. And then he suddenly seemed to forget himself and worst of all, he would suddenly burst into a loud guffaw of laughter, apropos of nothing. 
this inclination quickly passed off after a glass of champagne which ivan ilyitch had not meant to drink though he had poured it out and suddenly drank it quite by accident after that glass he felt at once almost inclined to cry he felt that he was sinking into a most peculiar state of sentimentality he began to be again filled with love he loved everyone even pseldonimov even the young man on the comic paper he suddenly longed to embrace all of them to forget everything and to be reconciled what is more to tell them everything openly all all that is to tell them what a good nice man he was with what wonderful talents what services he would do for his country how good he was at entertaining the fair sex and above all how progressive he was how humanely ready he was to be indulgent to all to the very lowest and finally in conclusion to tell them frankly all the motives that had impelled him to turn up at pseldonimov's uninvited to drink two bottles of champagne and to make him happy with his presence the truth the holy truth and candor before all things i will capture them by candor they will believe me i see it clearly they actually look at me with hostility but when i tell them all i shall conquer them completely they will fill their glasses and drink my health with shouts the officer will break his glass on his fur perhaps they will even shout hurrah even if they want to toss me after the hussar fashion i will not oppose them and indeed it would be very jolly i will kiss the bride on her forehead she is charming akim petrovitch is a very nice man too pseldonimov will improve of course later on he will acquire so to speak a society polish and although of course the younger generation has not that delicacy of feeling yet yet i will talk to them about the contemporary significance of russia among the european states i will refer to the peasant question too yes and and they will all like me and i shall live with glory these dreams were of course extremely agreeable but what was unpleasant was that in the midst of these roseate anticipations ivan ilyitch suddenly discovered in himself another unexpected propensity that was to spit anyway saliva began running from his mouth apart from any will of his own he observed this on akim petrovitch whose cheek he spluttered upon and who sat not daring to wipe it off from respectfulness ivan ilyitch took his dinner napkin and wiped it himself but this immediately struck him himself as so incongruous so opposed to all common sense that he sank into silence and began wondering though akim petrovitch emptied his glass yet he sat as though he were scolded ivan ilyitch reflected now that he had for almost a quarter of an hour been talking to him about some most interesting subjects but that akim petrovitch had not only seemed embarrassed as he listened but positively frightened pseldonimov who was sitting one chair away from him also craned his neck towards him and bending his head sideways listened to him with the most unpleasant air he actually seemed to be keeping a watch on him turning his eyes upon the rest of the company he saw that many were looking straight at him and laughing but what was strangest of all was that he was not in the least embarrassed by it on the contrary he sipped his glass again and suddenly began speaking so that all could hear i was saying just now he began as loudly as possible i was saying just now ladies and gentlemen to akim petrovitch that russia yes russia in short you understand that i mean to say russia is living it is my profound conviction through a period of hu humanity hu humanity was heard at the other end of the table hu hu too too ivan ilyitch stopped pseldonimov got up from his chair and began trying to see who had shouted akim petrovitch stealthily shook his head as though admonishing the guests ivan ilyitch saw this distinctly but in his confusion said nothing humanity he continued obstinately and this evening and only this evening i said to stepan nikiforovitch yes that uh, 
that the regeneration, so to speak, of things... Your Excellency was heard a loud exclamation at the other end of the table. What is your pleasure, answered Ivan Ilyich, pulled up short and trying to distinguish who had called to him. Nothing at all, Your Excellency. I was carried away. Continue, continue, the voice was heard again. Ivan Ilyich felt upset. The regeneration, so to speak, of those same things. Your Excellency, the voice shouted again. What do you want? How do you do? This time Ivan Ilyich could not restrain himself. He broke off his speech and turned to the assailant who had disturbed the general harmony. He was a very young lad, still at school, who had taken more than a drop too much and was an object of great suspicion to the general. He had been shouting for a long time past and had even broken a glass and two plates, maintaining that this was the proper thing to do at a wedding. At the moment when Ivan Ilyich turned towards him, the officer was beginning to pitch into the noisy youngster. What are you about? Why are you yelling? We shall turn you out. That's what we shall do. I don't mean you, Your Excellency. I don't mean you. Continue, cried the hilarious schoolboy, lolling back in his chair. Continue. I am listening and am very, very, very much pleased with you. Praiseworthy praiseworthy the wretched boy is drunk said pseldonimov in a whisper i see that he is drunk but i was just telling a very amusing anecdote your excellency began the officer about a lieutenant in our company who was talking just like that to his superior officers so this young man is imitating him now to every word of his superior officers he said praiseworthy praiseworthy he was turned out of the army ten years ago on account of it. What lieutenant was that? In our company, Your Excellency, he went out of his mind over the word praiseworthy. At first, they tried gentle methods. Then they put him under arrest. His commanding officer admonished him in the most fatherly way, and he answered, praiseworthy, praiseworthy. And strange to say, the officer was a fine-looking man, over six feet. They meant to court-martial him, but then they perceived that he was mad. So, a schoolboy, a schoolboy's prank need not be taken seriously. For my part, I am ready to overlook it. They had the medical inquiry, Your Excellency. Upon my word, but he was alive, wasn't he? What? Did they dissect him? A loud and almost universal roar of laughter resounded among the guests who had till then behaved with decorum. Ivan Ilyich was furious. Ladies and gentlemen, he shouted, at first a scarcely stammering, I am fully capable of apprehending that a man is not dissected alive. I imagined that in his derangement he had ceased to be alive, that is, that he had died, that is, I mean to say, that you don't like me, and yet I like you all. Yes, I like poor Porfiry. I am lowering myself by speaking like this. At that moment, Ivan Ilyich spluttered so that a great dab of saliva flew onto the tablecloth in a most conspicuous place. Pseldonimov flew to wipe it off with a table napkin. This last disaster crushed him completely. My friends, this is too much, he cried in despair. The man is drunk, Your Excellency, Pseldonimov prompted him again. Porfiry, I see that you all... Yes, I say that I hope... Yes, I call upon you all to tell me in what way have I lowered myself. Ivan Ilyich was almost crying. Your Excellency, good heavens! Porfiry, I appeal to you. Tell me, when I came... Yes. Yes, to your wedding, I had an object. I was aiming at moral elevation. I wanted it to be felt. I appeal to all. Am I greatly lowered in your eyes or not? A death-like silence. That was just it, a death-like silence. And to such a downright question. They might at least shout at this minute. Flashed through His Excellency's head. But the guests only looked at one another. 
Akim Petrovitch sat more dead than alive, while Pseldonimov, numb with terror, was repeating to himself the awful question which had occurred to him more than once already. What shall I have to pay for all this tomorrow? At this point the young man on the comic paper, who was very drunk, but who had hitherto sat in morose silence, addressed Ivan Ilyitch directly, and with flashing eyes began answering in the name of the whole company. Yes, he said in a loud voice. Yes, you have lowered yourself. Yes, you are a reactionary. Reactionary. Young man, you are forgetting yourself. To whom are you speaking? So to express it, Ivan Ilyitch cried furiously, jumping up from his seat again. To you, and secondly, I am not a young man. You've come to give yourself airs and try to win popularity. Pseldonimov, what does this mean? cried Ivan Ilyitch. But Pseldonimov was reduced to such horror that he stood still like a post and was utterly at a loss what to do. The guests too sat mute in their seats, all but the artist and the schoolboy who applauded and shouted, Bravo! Bravo! The young man on the comic paper went on shouting with unrestrained violence. Yet you came to show off your humanity. You've hindered the enjoyment of everyone. You've been drinking champagne without thinking that it is beyond the means of a clerk at ten roubles a month. And I suspect that you are one of those high officials who are a little too fond of the young wives of their clerks. What is more, I am convinced that you support state monopolies. Yes, yes, yes. Pseldonimov, Pseldonimov, shouted Ivan Ilyitch, holding out his hands to him. He felt that every word uttered by the comic young man was a fresh dagger at his heart. Directly, Your Excellency, please do not disturb yourself, Pseldonimov cried energetically, rushing up to the comic young man, seizing him by the collar and dragging him away from the table. Such physical strength could indeed not have been expected from the weakly looking Pseldonimov but the comic young man was very drunk, while Pseldonimov was perfectly sober. Then he gave him two or three cuffs in the back and thrust him out of the door. You are all scoundrels, roared the young man of the comic paper. I will caricature you all tomorrow in the firebrand. They all leapt up from their seats. Your Excellency, Your Excellency, cried Pseldonimov, his mother and several others crowding around the general, your Excellency, do not be disturbed. No, no, cried the general. I am annihilated. I came, I meant to bless you, so to speak, and this is how I am paid for everything, everything. He sank onto a chair as though unconscious, laid both his arms on the table and bowed his head over them straight into a plate of blanc mange. There is no need to describe the general horror. A minute later he got up, evidently meaning to go out, gave a lurch, stumbled against the leg of a chair, fell full length on the floor and snored. This is what is apt to happen to men who don't drink when they accidentally take a glass too much. They preserve their consciousness to the last point, to the last minute, and then fall to the ground as though struck down. Ivan Ilyitch lay on the floor absolutely unconscious. Pseldonimov clutched at his hair and sat as though petrified in that position. The guests made haste to depart, commenting each in his own way on the incident. It was about three o'clock in the morning. End of chapter 5, part 3, recording by Fanny, Thessaloniki, Greece. Chapter 6 of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Chapter 6 An Unpleasant Predicament. Part 4. The worst of it was that Pseldonimov's circumstances were far worse than could have been imagined, in spite of the unattractiveness of his present surroundings. And why, 
Ivan Ilyich is lying on the floor, and Pseldonimov is standing over him, tearing his hair in despair. We will break off the thread of our story and say a few explanatory words about Porfiry Petrovich Pseldonimov. Not more than a month before his wedding, he was in a state of hopeless destitution. He came from a province where his father had served in some department, and where he had died while awaiting his trial on some charge. When five months before his wedding, Pseldonimov, who had been in hopeless misery in Petersburg for a whole year before, got his berth at ten roubles a month, he revived both physically and mentally, but he was soon crushed by circumstances again. There were only two Pseldonimovs left in the world, himself and his mother, who had left the province after her husband's death. The mother and son barely existed in the freezing cold and sustained life on the most dubious substances. There were days when Pseldonimov himself went with a jug to the Fontanka for water to drink. When he got his place, he succeeded in settling with his mother in a corner. She took in washing, while for four months he scraped together every farthing to get himself boots and an overcoat, and what troubles he had to endure at his office. His superiors approached him with the question, how long was it since he had had a bath? There was a rumor about him that under the collar of his uniform there were nests of bugs. But Pseldonimov was a man of strong character. On the surface he was mild and meek. He had the merest smattering of education. He was practically never heard to talk of anything. I do not know for certain whether he thought made plans and theories, had dreams. But on the other hand, there was being formed within him an instinctive, furtive, unconscious determination to fight his way out of his wretched circumstances. He had the persistence of an ant. Destroy an ant's nest, and they will begin at once re-erecting it. Destroy it again, and they will begin again without wearying. He was a constructive house-building animal. One could see from his brow that he would make his way, would build his nest, and perhaps even save for a rainy day. His mother was the only creature in the world who loved him, and she loved him beyond everything. She was a woman of resolute character, hard-working and indefatigable, and at the same time good-natured so perhaps they might have lived in their corner for five or six years till their circumstances changed, if they had not come across the retired titular councillor Mlekopitaev, who had been a clerk in the treasury, and had served at one time in the provinces, but had lately settled in Petersburg, and had established himself there with his family. He knew Pseldonimov, and had at one time been under some obligation to his father. He had a little money, not a large sum, of course, but there it was. How much it was, no one knew, not his wife, nor his elder daughter, nor his relations. He had two daughters, and, as he was an awful bully, a drunkard, a domestic tyrant, and, in addition to that, an invalid, he took it into his head one day to marry one of his daughters to Pseldonimov. I knew his father, he would say. He was a good fellow, and his son will be a good fellow. Mlekopitaev did exactly as he liked. His word was law. He was a very queer bully. For the most part, he spent his time sitting in an armchair, having lost the use of his legs from some disease which did not, however, prevent him from drinking vodka. For days together he would be drinking and swearing. He was an ill-natured man. He always wanted to have someone whom he could be continually tormenting. And for that purpose he kept several distant relations. His sister, a sickly and peevish woman, two of his wise sisters, also ill-natured and very free with their tongues, and his old aunt, 
who had, through some accident, a broken rib. He kept another dependent also, a Russianized German, for the sake of her talent for entertaining him with stories from the Arabian Nights. His sole gratification consisted in jeering at all these unfortunate women and abusing them every minute with all his energies, though the latter, not accepting his wife, who had been born with toothache, dared not utter a word in his presence. He set them at loggerheads at one another, inventing and fostering spiteful backbiting and dissensions among them, and then laughed and rejoiced, seeing how they were ready to tear one another to pieces. He was very much delighted when his elder daughter, who had lived in great poverty for ten years with her husband, an officer of some sort, and was at last left a widow, came to live with him with three little sickly children. He could not endure her children, but as her arrival had increased the material upon which he could work his daily experiments, the old man was very much pleased. All these ill-natured women and sickly children, together with their tormentor, were crowded together in a wooden house on Petersburg side, and did not get enough to eat because the old man was stingy and gave out to the money a farthing at a time, though he did not grudge himself vodka. They did not get enough sleep because the old man suffered from sleeplessness and insisted on being amused. In short, they were all in misery and cursed their fate. It was at that time that Mlekopitaev's eye fell upon Pseldonimov. He was struck by his long nose and submissive air. His weakly and unprepossessing younger daughter had just reached the age of seventeen. Though she had at one time attended a German school, she had acquired scarcely anything but the alphabet. Then she grew up rickety and anemic, in fear of her crippled, drunken father's crutch, in a bedlam of domestic backbiting, eavesdropping, and scolding. She had never had any friends or any brains. She had for a long time been eager to be married. In company she sat mute, but at home with her mother and the women of the household she was spiteful and cantankerous. She was particularly fond of pinching and smacking her sister's children, telling tales of their pilfering bread and sugar, and this led to endless and implacable strife with her elder sister. Her old father himself offered her to Pseldonimov. Miserable as the latter's position was, he yet asked for a little time to consider. His mother and he hesitated for a long time. But with the young lady there was to come as dowry a house, and though it was a nasty little wooden house of one story, yet it was property of a kind. Moreover, they would give with her four hundred rubles, and how long it would take him to save it up himself? What am I taking the man into my house for? shouted the drunken bully. In the first place, because you are all females, and I am sick of female society. I want Pseldonimov, too, to dance to my piping, for I am his benefactor. And in the second place, I am doing it because you are all cross and don't want it, so I'll do it to spite you. What I have said, I have said. And you beat her, Porphyry, when she is your wife. She has been possessed of seven devils ever since she was born. You beat them out of her, and I'll get the stick ready. Pseldonimov made no answer, but he was almost decided. Before the wedding, his mother and he were taken into the house, washed, clothed, provided with boots and money for the wedding. The old man took them under his protection, possibly just because the whole family was prejudiced against them. He positively liked Pseldonimov's mother, so that he actually restrained himself and did not jeer at her. On the other hand, he made Pseldonimov dance the Cossack dance a week before the wedding. Well, that's enough. I only wanted to see whether you remembered your position before me or not, he said at the end of the dance. 
he allowed just enough money for the wedding, with nothing to spare, and invited all his relations and acquaintances. On Pseldonimov's side there was no one but the young man who wrote for the firebrand, and Akim Petrovich, the guest of honor. Pseldonimov was perfectly aware that his bride cherished an aversion for him, and that she was set upon marrying the officer instead of him. But he put up with everything. He had made a compact with his mother to do so. The old father had been drunk and abusive and foul-tongued the whole of the wedding day, and during the party in the evening. The whole family took refuge in the back rooms and were crowded there to suffocation. The front rooms were devoted to the dance and the supper. At last, when the old man fell asleep dead drunk at eleven o'clock, the bride's mother, who had been particularly displeased with Pseldonimov's mother that day, made up her mind to lay aside her wreath, become gracious, and join the company. Ivan Ilyich's arrival had turned everything upside down. Madame Blakopitaev was overcome with embarrassment and began grumbling that she had not been told that the general had been invited. She was assured that he had come uninvited, but was so stupid as to refuse to believe it. Champagne had to be got. Pseldonimov's mother had only one rouble, while Pseldonimov himself had not one farthing. He had to grovel before his ill-natured mother-in-law to beg for the money for one bottle and then for another. They pleaded for the sake of his future position in service, for his career. They tried to persuade her. She did at last give from her own purse, but she forced Pseldonimov to swallow such a cupful of gall and bitterness that more than once he ran into the room where the nuptial couch had been prepared, and madly clutching at his hair and trembling all over with impotent rage, he buried his head in the bed destined for the joys of paradise. No, indeed, Ivan Ilyich had no notion of the price paid for the two bottles of Jackson he had drunk that evening. What was the horror? the misery and even the despair of Pseldonimov when Ivan Ilyich's visit ended in this unexpected way. He had a prospect again of no end of misery, and perhaps a night of tears and outcries from his peevish bride and upbraidings from her unreasonable relations. Even apart from this, his head ached already and there was dizziness and mist before his eyes. And here Ivan Ilyich needed looking after. At three o'clock at night he had to hunt for a doctor or a carriage to take him home, and a carriage it must be, for it would be impossible to let an ordinary cabby take him in that condition. And where could he get the money even for a carriage? Madame Mlekopitaev, furious that the general had not addressed two words to her, and had not even looked at her supper, declared that she had not a farthing. Possibly she really had not a farthing. Where could he get it? What was he to do? Yes, indeed, he had good cause to tear his hair. Meanwhile, Ivan Ilyich was moved to a little leather sofa that stood in the dining-room. While they were clearing the tables and putting them away, Pseldonimov was rushing all over the place to borrow money. He even tried to get it from the servants, but it appeared that nobody had any. He even ventured to trouble Akim Petrovich, who had stayed after the other guests. But good-natured as he was, the latter was reduced to such bewilderment and even alarm at the mention of money that he uttered the most unexpected and foolish phrases. "'Another time with pleasure,' he muttered. "'But now you really must excuse me.' And, taking his cap, he ran as fast as he could out of the house. Only the good-natured youth who had talked about the dream-book was any use at all, and even that came to nothing. He too stayed after the others, showing genuine sympathy with Pseldonimov's misfortunes. 
At last Pseldonimov, together with his mother and the young man, decided in consultation not to send for a doctor, but rather to fetch a carriage and take the invalid home, and meanwhile to try certain domestic remedies till the carriage arrived, such as moistening his temples and his head with cold water, putting ice on his head, and so on. Pseldonimov's mother undertook this task. The friendly youth flew off in search of a carriage. As there were not even ordinary cabs to be found on the Petersburg side at that hour, he went off to some livery stables at a distance to wake up the coachman. They began bargaining, and declared that five roubles would be little to ask for a carriage at that time of night. They agreed to come, however, for three. When at last, just before five o'clock, the young man arrived at Pseldonimov's with the carriage, they had changed their minds. It appeared that Ivan Ilyich, who was still unconscious, had become so seriously unwell, was moaning and tossing so terribly, that to move him and take him home in such a condition was impossible and actually unsafe. "'What will it lead to next?' said Pseldonimov, utterly disheartened. What was to be done? A new problem arose. If the invalid remained in the house, where should he be moved, and where could they put him? There were only two bedsteads in the house, one large double bed, in which old Mlekopitaev and his wife slept, and another double bed of imitation walnut, which had just been purchased and was destined for the newly married couple. All the other inhabitants of the house slept on the floor, side by side, on feather beds, for the most part in bad condition and stuffy, anything but presentable, in fact, and even of these the supply was insufficient. There was not one to spare. Where could the invalid be put? A feather bed might perhaps have been found. It might, in the last resort, have been pulled from under some one, but where and on what could a bed have been made up? It seemed that the bed must be made up in the drawing-room, for that room was the furthest from the bosom of the family, and had a door into the passage. But on what could the bed be made? Surely not upon chairs. We all know that beds can only be made up on chairs for schoolboys when they come home for the weekend and it would be terribly lacking in respect to make up a bed in that way for a personage like Ivan Ilyich. What would be said next morning when he found himself lying on chairs? Pseldonimov would not hear of that. The only alternative was to put him on the bridal couch. This bridal couch, as we have mentioned already, was in a little room that opened out of the dining-room. On the bedstead was a double mattress, actually newly bought first-hand, clean sheets, four pillows in pink calico, covered with frilled muslin cases. The quilt was of pink satin, and it was quilted in patterns. Muslin curtains hung down from a golden ring overhead. In fact, it was all just as it should be, and the guests, who had all visited the bridal chamber, had admired the decoration of it. Though the bride could not endure Pseldonimov, she had several times in the course of the evening run in to have a look at it on the sly. What was her indignation, her wrath, when she learned that they meant to move an invalid, suffering from something not unlike a mild attack of cholera, to her bridal couch? The bride's mother took her part, broke into abuse, and vowed she would complain to her husband next day. But Pseldonimov asserted himself and insisted. Ivan Ilyich was moved into the bridal chamber, and a bed was made up on chairs for the young people. The bride whimpered, would have liked to pinch him, but dared not disobey. Her papa had a crutch with which she was very familiar, and she knew that her papa would call her to account next day. 
To console her, they carried the pink satin quilt and pillows and muslin cases into the drawing-room. At that moment the youth arrived with the carriage, and was horribly alarmed that the carriage was not wanted. He was left to pay for it himself, and he never had as much as a ten kopeck piece. Pseldonimov explained that he was utterly bankrupt. They tried to parley with the driver, but he began to be noisy and even to batter on the shutters. How it ended I don't know exactly. I believe the youth was carried off to Pesky by way of a hostage to Fourth Rozdensky Street, where he hoped to rouse a student who was spending the night at a friend's and to try whether he had any money. It was going on for six o'clock in the morning when the young people were left alone and shut up in the drawing-room. Pseldonimov's mother spent the whole night by the bedside of the sufferer. She installed herself on a rug on the floor and covered herself with an old coat, but could not sleep because she had to get up every minute. Ivan Ilyich had a terrible attack of colic. Madame Pseldonimov a woman of courage and greatness of soul, undressed him with her own hands, took off all his things, looked after him as if he were her own son, and spent the whole night carrying basins, etc., from the bedroom across the passage, and bringing them back empty. And yet the misfortunes of that night were not yet over. Not more than ten minutes after the young people had been shut up alone in the drawing-room, a piercing shriek was suddenly heard. Not a cry of joy, but a shriek of the most sinister kind. The screams were followed by a noise, a crash, as though of the falling of chairs, and instantly there burst into the still dark room a perfect crowd of exclaiming and frightened women, attired in every kind of déshabillé. These women were the bride's mother, her older sister, abandoning for a moment the sick children, and her three aunts, even the one with a broken rib dragged herself in. Even the cook was there, and the German lady who told stories, whose own feather bed, the best in the house and her only property, had been forcibly dragged from under her for the young couple, trailed in together with the others. All these respectable and sharp-eyed ladies had, a quarter of an hour before, made their way on tiptoe from the kitchen across the passage, and were listening in the ante-room, devoured by unaccountable curiosity. Meanwhile, someone lighted a candle, and a surprising spectacle met the eyes of all. The chairs, supporting the broad feather bed only at the sides, had parted under the weight and the feather bed had fallen between them on the floor. The bride was sobbing with anger. This time she was mortally offended. Pseldonimov, morally shattered, stood like a criminal caught in a crime. He did not even attempt to defend himself. Shrieks and exclamations sounded on all sides. Pseldonimov's mother ran up at the noise, but the bride's mamma on this occasion got the upper hand. She began by showering strange and for the most part quite undeserved reproaches, such as, A nice husband you are, after this, what are you good for after such a disgrace, and so on, and at last carried her daughter away from her husband, undertaking to bear the full responsibility for doing so with her ferocious husband, who would demand an explanation. All the others followed her out, exclaiming and shaking their heads. No one remained with Pseldonimov except his mother, who tried to comfort him, but he sent her away at once. He was beyond consolation. He made his way to the sofa and sat down in the most gloomy confusion of mind, just as he was, barefooted and in nothing but his night attire. His thoughts whirled in a tangled criss-cross in his mind. At times he mechanically looked about the room, where only a little while ago the dancers had been whirling madly, and in which the cigarette smoke still lingered. Cigarette ends and sweetmeat papers still littered the slopped and dirty floor. 
the wreck of the nuptial couch and the overturned chairs bore witness to the transitoriness of the fondest and surest earthly hopes and dreams he sat like this almost an hour the most oppressive thoughts kept coming into his mind such as the doubt what was in store for him in the office now he recognized with painful clearness that he would have at all costs to exchange into another department that he could not possibly remain where he was after all that had happened that evening he thought too of mlekopitaev who would probably make him dance the cossack dance next day to test his meekness he reflected too that though mlekopitaev had given fifty roubles for the wedding festivities every farthing of which had been spent he had not thought of giving him the four hundred roubles yet no mention had been made of it in fact and indeed even the house had not been formally made over to him he thought too of his wife who had left him at the most critical moment of his life of the tall officer who had dropped on one knee before her he had noticed that already he thought of the seven devils which according to the testimony of her own father were in possession of his wife and of the crutch in readiness to drive them out of course he felt equal to burying a great deal but destiny had let loose such surprises upon him that he might well have doubts of his fortitude so pseldonimov mused dolefully meanwhile the candle end was going out its fading light falling straight upon pseldonimov's profile threw a colossal shadow of it on the wall with a drawn-out neck a hooked nose and with two tufts of hair sticking out in his forehead and on the back of his head at last when the air was growing cool with the chill of early morning he got up frozen and spiritually numb crawled to the feather bed that was lying between the chairs and without rearranging anything without putting out the candle end without even laying the pillow under his head fell into a leaden death-like sleep such as the sleep of men condemned to flogging on the morrow must be on the other hand what could be compared with the agonizing night spent by ivan ilyich pralinsky on the bridal couch of the unlucky pseldonimov for some time headache vomiting and other most unpleasant symptoms did not leave him for one second he was in the torments of hell the faint glimpses of consciousness that visited his brain lighted up such an abyss of horrors such gloomy and revolting pictures that it would have been better for him not to have returned to consciousness everything was still in a turmoil in his mind however he recognized pseldonimov's mother for instance heard her gentle admonitions such as be patient my dear be patient good sir it won't be so bad presently he recognized her but could give no logical explanation of her presence beside him revolting phantoms haunted him most frequently of all he was haunted by semyon ivanovitch but looking more intently he saw that it was not semyon ivanitch but pseldonimov's nose he had visions too of the free and easy artist and the officer and the old lady with her face tied up what interested him most of all was the gilt ring which hung over his head through which the curtains hung he could distinguish it distinctly in the dim light of the candle end which lighted up the room and he kept wondering inwardly what was the object of that ring why was it there what did it mean he questioned the old lady several times about it but apparently did not say what he meant and she evidently did not understand it however much he struggled to explain at last by morning the symptoms had ceased and he fell into a sleep a sound sleep without dreams he slept about an hour and when he woke he was almost completely conscious with an insufferable headache and a disgusting taste in his mouth and on his tongue which seemed turned into a piece of cloth 
He sat up in bed, looked about him, and pondered. The pale light of morning, peeping through the cracks of the shutters in a narrow streak, quivered on the wall. It was about seven o'clock in the morning. But when Ivan Ilyitch suddenly grasped the position and recalled all that had happened to him since the evening, when he remembered all his adventures at supper, the failure of his magnanimous action, his speech at table, when he realized all at once with horrifying clearness all that might come of this now, all that people would say and think of him, when he looked round and saw to what a mournful and hideous condition he had reduced the peaceful bridal couch of his clerk, oh, then such deadly shame, such agony overwhelmed him that he uttered a shriek, hid his face in his hands, and fell back on the pillow in despair. A minute later he jumped out of bed, saw his clothes carefully folded and brushed on a chair beside him, and, seizing them, and as quickly as he could, in desperate haste, began putting them on, looking round and seeming terribly frightened at something. On another chair close by lay his greatcoat and fur cap, and his yellow gloves were in his cap. He meant to steal away secretly. But suddenly the door opened, and the elder Madame Pseldonimov walked in with an earthenware jug and basin. A towel was hanging over her shoulder. She set down the jug, and without further conversation told him that he must wash. "'Come, my good sir, wash. You can't go without washing.' And at that instant Ivan Ilyitch recognized that if there was one being in the whole world whom he need not fear, and before whom he need not feel ashamed, it was that old lady. He washed, and long afterwards, at painful moments of his life, he recalled, among other pangs of remorse, all the circumstances of that waking, and that earthenware basin, and the china jug filled with cold water, in which there were still floating icicles, and the oval cake of soap at fifteen kopecks, in pink paper, with letters embossed on it, evidently bought for the bridal pair, though it fell to Ivan Ilyitch to use it, and the old lady with a linen towel over her left shoulder. The cold water refreshed him, he dried his face, and without even thanking his sister of mercy, he snatched up his hat, flung over his shoulders the coat handed to him by Pseldonimov, and, crossing the passage, and the kitchen where the cat was already mewing, and the cook sitting up in her bed staring after him with greedy curiosity, ran out into the yard and into the street and threw himself into the first sledge he came across. It was a frosty morning, a chilly yellow fog still hid the house and everything. Ivan Ilyitch turned up his collar. He thought that everyone was looking at him that they were all recognizing him, all. For eight days he did not leave the house or show himself at the office. He was ill, wretchedly ill, but more morally than physically. He lived through a perfect hell in those days, and they must have been reckoned to his account in the other world. There were moments when he thought of becoming a monk and entering a monastery. There really were. His imagination, indeed, took special excursions during that period. He pictured subdued subterranean singing, an open coffin, living in a solitary cell, forests and caves. But when he came to himself he recognized almost at once that all this was dreadful nonsense and exaggeration, and was ashamed of this nonsense. Then began attacks of moral agony on the theme of his existence manque. Then shame flamed up again in his soul, took complete possession of him at once, consumed him like fire, and reopened his wounds. He shuddered as pictures of all sorts rose before his mind. What would people say about him? What would they think when he walked into his office? What a whisper would dog his steps for a whole year, ten years, his whole life. His story would go down to posterity. 
he sometimes fell into such dejection that he was ready to go straight off to Semyon Ivanovitch and ask for his forgiveness and friendship. He did not even justify himself. There was no limit to his blame of himself. He could find no extenuating circumstances and was ashamed of trying to. He had thoughts, too, of resigning his post at once and devoting himself to human happiness as a simple citizen in solitude. In any case, he would have completely to change his whole circle of acquaintances, and so thoroughly as to eradicate all memory of himself. Then the thought occurred to him that this, too, was nonsense, and that if he adopted greater severity with his subordinates, it might all be set right. Then he began to feel hope and courage again. At last, at the expiration of eight days of hesitation and agonies, he felt that he could not endure to be in uncertainty any longer, and, un beau matin, he made up his mind to go to the office. He had pictured a thousand times over his return to the office as he sat at home in misery. With horror and conviction he told himself that he would certainly hear behind him an ambiguous whisper, would see ambiguous faces, would intercept ominous smiles. What was his surprise when nothing of the sort happened? He was greeted with respect, he was met with bows, everyone was grave, everyone was busy. His heart was filled with joy as he made his way to his own room. He set to work at once with the utmost gravity. He listened to some reports and explanations, settled doubtful points. He felt as though he had never explained knotty points and given his decisions so intelligently, so judiciously, as that morning. He saw that they were satisfied with him, that they respected him, that he was treated with respect. The most thin-skinned sensitiveness could not have discovered anything. At last, Akim Petrovitch made his appearance with some documents. The sight of him sent a stab to Ivan Ilyitch's heart, but only for an instant. He went into the business with Akim Petrovitch, talked with dignity, explained things, and showed him what was to be done. The only thing he noticed was that he avoided looking at Akim Petrovitch for any length of time, or rather, Akim Petrovitch seemed afraid of catching his eye. But at last Akim Petrovitch had finished and began to collect his papers. And there is one other matter, he began as dryly as he could. The Kirk Pseldonimov's petition to be transferred to another department. His Excellency Semyon Ivanovitch Shipulenko has promised him a post. He pegs your gracious assent, your Excellency. Oh, so he's being transferred, said Ivan Ilyich, and he felt as though a heavy weight had rolled off his heart. He glanced at Akim Petrovitch, and at that instant their eyes met. Certainly, I for my part, I will use, answered Ivan Ilyich. I am ready. Akim Petrovitch evidently wanted to slip away as quickly as he could, but in a rush of generous feeling, Ivan Ilyich determined to speak out. Apparently some inspiration had come to him again. Tell him, he began, bending a candid glance full of profound meaning upon Akim Petrovitch, tell Pseldonimov that I feel no ill will. No, I do not. That on the contrary I am ready to forget all that has passed, to forget it all. But all at once Ivan Ilyich broke off, looking with wonder at the strange behavior of Akim Petrovitch, who suddenly seemed transformed from a sensible person into a fearful fool. Instead of listening and hearing Ivan Ilyich to the end, he suddenly flushed crimson in the silliest way, began with positively unseemly haste making strange little bows, and at the same time edging towards the door. His whole appearance betrayed a desire to sink through the floor, or more accurately, to get back to his table as quickly as possible. Ivan Ilyich, left alone, got up from his chair in confusion. 
he looked in the looking-glass without noticing his face no severity severity and nothing but severity he whispered almost unconsciously and suddenly a vivid flush overspread his face he felt suddenly more ashamed more weighed down than he had been in the most insufferable moments of his eight days of tribulation i did break down he said to himself and sank helplessly into his chair End of section 6 Reading by Malone